dropping some knowledge and a little love and a little love. This this is the Fire on Your Head podcast with your host Steve Bremner. Steve Bremner. Steve Bremner, missionary to Peru and blogger at stevebremner.com. The podcast where we tackle gray areas your pastor doesn't talk about. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Bremner. Welcome to Fire on Your Head. I'm Steve Bremner. I'm your host. Today's guest is a relatively high-profile guest. She's a Florida State representative and very prolific author named Kimberly Daniels. I'm going to actually keep this introduction short and come back at you with an outro with some of my thoughts on how today's discussion went, some, some thoughts I was left with, some things that happened after having recorded the interview. And she's written a book called Breaking the Stronghold of Familiar Spirits. Is that what it's called? Something about familiar spirits. I'll get it right in the the outro. And she's got many other books she's also published over the years. So it was a great interview. I never would have had this come on my radar if not for Rachel Sammons at Charisma House reaching out to me, asking me if I'd be interested in this. And I told Kim in the interview that my initial reaction was no. I've, I've heard so many people with flaky ideas about familiar spirits and demons and deliverance and stuff that my knee-jerk reaction was to hesitate. But I felt like the Lord said, no, do this. You know, and not like he needed to twist my arm, but it's like, you know, I'm uh, always looking for a good conversation, a good interview, an interesting guest. And uh, so it's not like the Lord needs to twist my arm to do that. It was a great thing. And I'll, I'll elaborate on that in the outro. I don't even know if you want to call it an outro or a post face. Did you know there's such a thing as a post face? It's the opposite of a preface. I don't know if you'd pronounce it post face or what, but the same way you have some kind of preface, some kind of thing outside of the body of content that you put at the beginning of a book or some kind of other content, the post face is at the end. I discovered that because I'm rewriting one of my Kindle books and it's basically you know, got some update to it I I wanted to include, but I didn't feel it would be good to do as a preface. So I made it at the end and I was Googling it and found out there's such a thing as a post fuss. And uh, I thought it would make a better post fuss. So I'm not going to give away which book that is that I'm working on, but I do apologize in advance for those of you who may have already downloaded it and aren't thrilled to hear there's a new version of it when uh, that comes out. So just a couple more things. We're finished with SJ Hill's audiobook. What's God Really Like? I'm going to be posting very soon a sample chapter or a sample of one of the chapters, like 20, 25 minute clip. And uh, that'll be maybe the next episode. It'll it'll be soon. If you're a subscriber to the podcast, you'll get that soon. Uh, If you don't need to sample it and you already know you want to listen to it, I could use some reviewers. So contact me at fireonyourhead at stevebremner.com. And if you are somebody who's taken a promotional credit from me in the past, Don't contact me asking me for one for this book. I won't give it to you if you've not held up your end of the bargain before. A lot of people want these credits, but anyway. I've got a few uh, promotional credits to spare. Some of them are spoken for. As you know, at the time of recording this, it says in my audio creation exchange dashboard that it's on its way. It's headed to retail and it's been saying that for a few days. So anytime now, it should be live. Maybe when you're listening to this podcast, it's already live. And if you want to review it, we could use reviewers. Contact me. Uh, I've only got promo credits for the US and the UK stores, and that will help out a great deal. If you, you know, SJ will appreciate it. I appreciate it, obviously, being the narrator. And if you aren't an Audible subscriber, you've never listened to these books yet in audio format, you could become a subscriber. You can become an Audible member for the first 30 days for free at our link, audibletrial.com slash fire on your head, and they give you a free credit to boot. So You could use that towards SJ's book if you want. You could contact me, get a credit, and go join Ottawa. And there you go. You've got two credits. You've got one for SJ's book and one for whatever you want. And again, it'll it'll be greatly appreciated. So without any further ado, let's get back to the guest I am talking about. This is my interview with Kimberly Daniels.
Okay, well, let's, let's rock and roll with these. Okay, so from reading the book, I've read about two thirds of it. I just got it before the weekend, but, I, but I've got plenty of questions that I think would make good conversation that you'll have no difficulty getting your preach on or whatever. <laughs> and okay, okay. From, from the, my, my impression of the book, but I'd like to start with learning a little bit about you, about your background, how you wound up, you know, as a pastor and as a Florida state representative, because I think this legitimately is the first time I've had somebody who's in public service or in politics on this podcast. So I'd love to hear a bit about that. <laughs> well, first of all, I used to go to Capitol Hill as a minister with issues that pertain to the body of Christ, not understanding a lot, just as an intercessor, praying, connecting with different groups that support uh, family values. And that was the gist of what of my experience in politics. Coming back from Hong Kong on a short trip, you know, Hong Kong is, you, I think, one leg of the flight is 20-something hours, if I remember correctly. So going five days and turning around is quite something for the body. So I, I, I was very tired. And I took my children with me. So, you know, when I got back, I was resting, fell into a deep sleep, and I found myself standing before God, you know, in a vision. I did not see him because I couldn't see anything. I can only hear him mention the name of a lady and that she would not finish her race and that I needed to get on the ballot. Well, at the time she was running for mayor, then I didn't understand anything about politics, but I was help. I was r raising money for her. And I was like, in the dream, God, truly you couldn't be talking to me. Yeah, I don't even know anything about these positions. And as I was going back and forth with God, in my sleep, the phone rang. This was about 3 a.m. And it was the lady who God told me was going to get out the ballot, woke me up out of my sleep. I picked up the phone and she said, I'm getting off the ballot. And I was like, oh, my God. And I hung the phone back up. The Lord said, you call her and tell her. She said, you can't get into politics. They will kill you. I talked with a couple of my spiritual advisors, and they said, hey, what are you calling me for? If the Lord told you do it, I got on the ballot for an at-large city council race, which was a city-wide race of about a million people in the city. And in two months, having no experience, no campaign manager, two months I got on won that seat, and it, it was amazing. In two months, I became an at-large city council city council member, 93,000 votes. And, and what, what city is this again? I, I think you mentioned in the book. But... Jacksonville, Florida, yeah. where there had never been an African-American. I was the, the first African-American male won the same time I did. An African-American female Democrat had never won a citywide seat. And this was in 2011, if I'm Remember 2011. Right. Yeah. And were you also pastoring before that or did that happen since? I've been pastoring since 1991. Okay. So good. So good I've been while. pastoring for a while. I started out with a center for girls on drugs. You know, my background, I, I'm from the streets, although I had a full scholarship at Florida State University. I was the fastest female sprinter in the nation in June College and the fastest female sprinter in the world in the military and on the fastest sprint team in the nation at Florida State University. Three of the young ladies on that sprint team with me went to the Olympics and I left that track team and went to the crack house and started smoking dope. And for a year and a half of my life, I was like a, a street person. Right. And by the grace of God, yeah, look where, where you've come in the, the years and decades, I suppose, since. So you say in the book, on, I got here on page 60, that when you became a member of the House of, you know, the representatives, you know, after, I don't know if you want to get into the, the journey or the story where you didn't get reelected in, in, as a city council person. Oh, I want to listen. I want to talk about it all. I uh, said, I want to talk about it all. Yeah, you, I perfect. I want to talk about it all. When I didn't get reelected, I got elected. Because I got selected because I was just reading a word that God gave me in May, and I write things down a lot, in March 2016. He said, I promise you another term, but not in that seat. Yeah. So God allowed it. I couldn't have been moved out of that seat except the Lord allowed. You know, I'm, I'm a champion. You know, I'm a world-class sprinter. I have a son 
who has a Super Bowl ring who never played football in college. You know, I won campaigns with no political experience. So I'm used to the supernatural and I'm used to winning that, that, that spirit of the champion. So losing was like a shock. I couldn't even believe I lost. I was like looking at the TV saying, Is, are, are they finished? Is, I, did I lose? You know, I just was not used to that. And the Lord spoke to me as to quickly as to why, and it was really serious, and I'm not open to say that, why he took me out of that seat. And I said, okay, thank you, Jesus. And I, re- I received that. And the most powerful thing a champion can do is learn how to lose and how to, how to win and how to lose. So every champion must be a good loser. That's some good stuff. What I wanted to, to get at is you say early in your term, you sponsored this law that put prayer back in public schools in Florida. And, you know, I just highlighted that in the book and I thought, well, there you go. That's a, that's a pretty significant encouragement, I suppose, for just early on. I mean, I'm sure there's plenty more you, you, you've still got to do with this position where I guess I'm looking at it like, okay, I can forget maybe whatever disappointment I experienced in the past when I see a victory of sorts like this, you know? Well, can I say this? Sure. God gave me such a peace, and I went through so much warfare and so many legal attacks. And I'm sure that in the spirit realm, the enemy can see the favor around you and favor draw opposition. So the enemy can see the angels, can see the grace, can see the favor, and the devil fights that favor. And just because you lose a race, it don't mean you lose your favor. So uh, that was a time that I had to go through so I would know who was with me and who was not with me. There was a line being drawn in the spirit and everybody celebrates you when you're in a position and when you're a winner. But when you lose, that's when you really know what time it is. And even less than a year after the loss, God quickened me to get on the ballot for state representative of District 14. And when I tell you every entity, every organization, everything that every person that counted was against me, every union, every endorsement entity, it was just me and God. It was just me and God. And the Lord showed himself mighty. And by the time I got to Tallahassee, people wanted to meet the David. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because literally this race was like the incumbent, the lady that was in the seat. She was against me. With uh, I mean, it was just, I could go on and on and on. But sometimes God makes your way hard so that when you come out victorious, only he can get the glory. Mm-hmm. And when I stepped in Tallahassee, And when I went into my office and looked out the window and I looked at the Supreme Court right out my window and I could look a few blocks down from where I used to stand on the corner and smoke dope and wave down cars. Only the Lord could do such a thing like that. You know, I'm an athlete and people don't understand that when you're doing stuff, you're working out in the spirit. Mm -hmm. And if you're just working out with a little bit of weight, that's what you're going to get. But, you know, if you're working out in the natural, if you put some more weight on, you will be able to perform better. And people don't like to go through. But my one of my favorite sayings is when you go through, you grow through. And that's what happened in this political up and down situation. And here I am now, a member of the House of Representatives, where there's 120 representatives from the state of Florida, 41 Democrats, 79 Republicans. I am a Democrat doing an almost $90 billion budget uh, representing almost over 20 million people in the state, um, 150,000 people in my district. All I can say is only the Lord. Right. I just wrote down what you said about, you know, when you're lifting heavier weights, then you, you can perform better. And a mentor figure in my life, he has this analogy about like a rubber band. You know, we can feel like we're being stretched and stretched. And if you take a rubber band and you stretch it, and then when you let go, you can shoot it farther, you know? So it's like the stretching kind of propels us or makes us capable of going farther than we would have. You know, I like your analogy with the weights. So I don't know if you knew this about me, but I'm Canadian. I'm not an American citizen or anything. So just another question for my understanding about how the House of Representatives work. How long is your term as a representative? 
Well, I just finished my first term. Okay. Which is two sessions. We have a session each year. So I just completed two sessions. The first session, I the fir- I mean, <laughs> let's talk about this first session, okay? okay? I come out of this warfare. I mean, this battle. I mean, they they put false charges on me. I was on TV for stuff. That, they, these people, they do anything they can. And I always say this because they don't have anything and because they don't have stuff. So they have to make up stuff. That's just how it goes. And you can't take it. You don't need to get in it. You know, you got to be like Timex. You got to be able to take a licking and keep right on ticking. The kingdom of God suffering violence and the violence take it by force. And that take it don't necessarily just mean take the land. You got to learn how to take it. You know, you got to learn how to be talked about. You got to learn how to take a lick. See, the best fighter is not always the best puncher. You know, you got to be able to take a lick. And, and I could say in this campaign, I learned to take licks like never before. And when I got to Tallahassee, everybody was waiting to meet this lady, this girl who was by herself, who literally beat her and her God beat the system. You know, it was like a David and Goliath situation. And I'm taking a breath and, you know, people looking at me funny, you know what I'm saying? Because they don't know me. They heard so many things. And, you know, I'm looking at them funny. Mm-hmm. <laughs> you know, I don't, you don't know if you like me. I don't know if I like you. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I'm sitting up like, you know, you looking at me funny. I'm looking at you funny. This is a strange environment for me. And I'm sitting around in the midst of one of the biggest group of freshman representatives that we've had in our state in a long time. And then in the midst of processing and, and, you know, going through all the new stuff, I go to sleep and the Lord says, I want you to file a bill to put prayer in school. And I'm jumping up like, God, really? For re- God, really? Can I, can I take a break, a breath? You know, and I was like, oh, and it bothered me, really. I was like, what, God, I'm just, a- there are 79 Republicans, 41 Democrats. We are the minority. We sit in the back. Okay, in Florida, the Republicans sit up front. We sit in the back. We get everything that's left over. You know, only what is allowed to pass can pass. And that's just the reality. You know, if the Democrats were the majority, that's how it would be. Right now, I'm a Democrat, a blue dog Democrat, conservative Democrat. Let me emphasize Mm -hmm. that. And God say, put prayer back in school. And then the next night, you know, I'm waiting. You know, I'm not going to just trust me. Somebody going to have to confirm it. And I get a call three o'clock in the morning from an elderly lady who is a prophet. And she calls me. She says, sister, I just called to tell you, I don't know what's going on, but you're getting ready to need security. And I said, oh, wow. So I start looking up other states that have similar legislation, put my legislation in place. And literally, I'm praying in tongues because, you know, we got this system where you file it over your computer and push the button. I'm praying in tongues before I push this button. And it's not going to be known to the public, but it'll be known to my colleague. And I'm praying and I'm telling you, I'm like, Jesus, in the name of Jesus, the blood. And I push it to file it. And the next day I go to work and a lady in the Democratic Party comes up to me and she says, they want you to rock your bill. I'm new. I don't know nobody. And I don't I don't know her. She seems like a nice lady. But I'm saying, first of all, who are they? Who are they actually? And who are they that they can actually tell me to drop my bill? She said the Jews, you know, the Jewish caucus. And I was like, well. Wow. You know, I don't know much about politics. And I'm saying it seemed like the Jewish caucus would, you know, Jesus was a Jew. <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? <laughs> seemed like they would want this and they would want, this is not a Christian bill. This is a religious liberty bill for any religion. And then I had on the Christian side, strong Christians who said, but if you pass that bill, devil worshipers will pray. You know, and there's a very high man in position. And this is what gave me a piece that called me into his office, you know, to meet me. He's one of the higher up ranking people. And I say to him that God told me to do this bill. And he says the same thing about, you know, well, what about the devil worshipers and people are concerned about this. And then I told him, I said, well, listen, I said, well, this will be a Mount Carmel situation. Let everybody pray and we'll see whose God is God. We shouldn't be afraid of folk that pray that I believe really ain't got no power because there's only power in the name and in the blood of Jesus. And he looked at me and he said, can I ask you a question? And I was like, yeah. He said, is it true what they said about you? And I'm thinking, you know, I've been in the newspaper 
they said so many things about me. And I'm thinking like, well, what did they say about me? He said, they said that you are the devil's worst nightmare. That was my turning point. And I'm like, okay, God, that's my confirmation. And so they, the people who I asked the lady, can you tell whoever they are to come and talk to me? And it was the nicest Jewish man. He didn't mean any harm, but he was just, we don't want you to pray in Jesus' name. And I'm thinking to myself, like, wow, this is like the New Testament. You know, they think it's going to offend me. It ain't going to offend me because the word of God is manifesting. You know, we shouldn't be offended by truth. The name of Jesus makes things tremble and makes men's heart fear. Just saying his name, you know, make people tremble. And so he was talking to me in my office where the Supreme Court is. And I'm looking out there where I used to smoke dope and prostitute and do all of that. And I was very nice to him. I said, you know what? I want to pray with you. And I did something I wouldn't usually do. I said, you know, whenever I'm praying with you, I said, I'm going to do everything I can not to beat you down in the name of Jesus. I don't have to say Jesus, Jesus, Jesus to prove nothing to you. I said, because the very presence that I bring in the room, because greater is he that's in me than him that's in the world. And I said, I want to win you. And if we got a prayer caucus and you want to pray, and I'm telling you, this is because I'm that radical. I'll fight you, whatever. I'll do that. I said, but let me say this to you. I cannot promise you anything. I'll do my best. I said, because you know those Christians that are radical and the ones that probably is your worst nightmare, the holy rollers, tongue talkers, the ones that cast out demons and everybody. I said, that is who I am. I said, I am the devil's worst nightmare (laughs) because I'm not afraid of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Nice. I'm the same. I, I love tongues and uh, stuff like that too. And like I asked you at the beginning, I didn't know what kind of time you have on your hands, but I, you know, one more question about this. How does serving, you know, the public eye like that overlap or, you know, work with y- your ministry, pastoring and these other things? I would love to explore that a little bit because it's just fascinating to me. Like I said, I've never had someone in a position like yours on this podcast before. So you're provoking me with a bunch of different questions and curiosities. How does ministry and, you know, public service overlap? Well, public service is a marketplace ministry. Okay. And I just don't believe in separation of church and state in the context that the other side will put it in because you cannot separate the church from the state because the state came out of the church. The church didn't come out of the state. People came to America for religious liberty. So I just don't buy the lie. You know, I just don't buy the lie. I know that this country and the leadership of America, the purpose, not saying if men lined up with that purpose or did what they were supposed to do, but the reason that this country is the America that it is today because it was dedicated to God. And so as we grow and as we move on, people are trying to move further away from God. And I just don't buy the lie. As a pastor, I used to sit back and get problems and I can only pray about them. But faith without work is dead. But now I can call different entities and different agencies and be a voice, not just praying for people, but at the table. And a very wise woman once told me, if you don't have a seat at the table, then you're on the menu. (laughs) And so... I believe that believers have been on the menu for so long because we're not sitting at the table. Mm -hmm. So Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were sitting at the table. Daniel was sitting at the table. When Hezekiah, you know, people didn't impeach Hezekiah. God sent a prophet to tell him, I'm going to shut your reign down. So if we look in the Bible, church and state was not separated. Most kings had prophets. And you know what? Prophets uh, held a lot of weight and the words of prophets held a lot of weight. And so the church has to get back into the posture where we get back in place so that we can be at the table so that we won't be on the menu. I love it. (laughs) If you're you're not at the table, you're on the menu. Okay. So your book, the one that I was sent to talk to you about called Breaking the Power of Familiar Spirits. And I'm not going to lie to you. When I got the email, I was like, I don't know if I want to read a book on familiar. I don't know. It sounds flaky. It might be, I don't know. I've met people who are kind of weird, but then, uh, you know, I felt like the Lord said, no, grab this book and offer to do it. I've been highlighting all sorts of things in it, 
not just things to like ask you, but like things that are like, oh, that's good. And I think one of the things I'm enjoying about your writing style in this book is how often you preface some sections by saying, yeah, I'm going to lose some of you readers, but I don't care. Or, you know, like I'm about to say something, (laughs) I'm about to say some stuff you're probably not going to agree with. And um, so then that gets my like antenna up. I'm like, okay, what's she going to get into? So, you know, I'm, I'm chewing on some stuff, processing some stuff I've never thought of before, never given much thought to, I should say. And uh, so for the benefit of the listener who might not have any idea what a familiar spirit is, could you, you know, give your definition of what's a familiar spirit? Well, a familiar spirit, like I said in my book, I could not find anything that agreed with my spirit on familiar spirit, but I think some of the sources says that the word familiar comes from the Latin word familiaris, which means household servant. And so the idea behind the term familiar spirit is always related to sorcery and witchcraft, you know, and entertaining, you know, familiar spirits on the dark side. But my book brings familiar spirits to a lifestyle, everyday things that operate behind the scenes that you may not pay attention to. And one of the scriptures is says about how the enemy will creep in unawares. I remember my stepmom, who was a powerful woman of God, she used to always tell me, don't entertain familiar spirits. So a familiar spirit is a specific type of evil thing that's identified by familiarity. You know, um, I could say it says a a family demon, a bloodline curse, also a spirit associated with becoming too common with persons, place, or things. It can also be witchcraft that works through divination. This spirit works through mediums, operate through counterfeit Holy Spirit, counterfeit Jesus. So familiar spirits come as angels of light or come, as God said, my people perish as a lack of knowledge. This book really talks about things that go on that may cause some subliminal or undercover things to go on and we not... You can pay your tithe and you can fast and you can pray and you can do whatever you want to do. And there's still something there. And that's when you might want to challenge or deal with a familiar spirit that has not been dealt with, for instance, such as a soul tie. Right. And, and for the benefit of someone listening who doesn't know what a soul tie is? Well, a soul tie is to be connected to someone in the soulish realm to the point or something, it could be a person, a place, or a thing, to be connected to the point where it obsesses, oppresses, depresses, and gets heavy on the mind and controls your life. And the way you know that it's a soul type, it's a type of addiction or something that, and you'll even get to the place where you know that this is not good, but you find yourself dealing with it in a vicious cycle over and over again. And a lot of people, they do confessions, they do other things, but getting to the root of a lot of deliverance, not all the time, it can be a soul time. Right. So you know, I've got another highlight from the book I wanted to ask you about. I mean, I know what your, your answer is going to be, but I want to uh, put it out there is uh, on page 21. Can Christians have demons? Hello? Page 21. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, I can now. You faded up for a moment. Oh. You, well, you know the phone gonna go out now. <laughs> it, was, it was a time to get some interference right. now. Um, let's talk about that. That's very, very important because there's a balance in that. As believers, we need to walk in faith. You know, we don't need to walk in fear. For example, a young man that I'm mentoring right now, he got in trouble. He's getting ready to go to college to play football. And a lady who operates in for me experience actually divination pray for him and when he found out about it he was really really worried and he was like i need you to pray for me tonight i don't want and see that's what we don't want to do because i told him i said listen she is operating in witchcraft but greater is he that's in you than him that's in the world we're going to pray we're going to knock that thing off and we're going to move on because she don't have power over you so we don't want to say, oh, a Christian can have a demon and we be going around san- spiritually sanitizing ourselves everywhere we go. But there is a principle that must be understood. 
The Bible says in Matthew, the 12th chapter, around the 20 some 28th verse, it says when an unclean spirit goes out of, you know, it's around the 40 something verse. When an unclean spirit goes out of a man, it goes out seeking dry places. And when it finds none, it comes back to its house. Okay. That has been swept clean and garnished. So the Bible clearly talks about a person having gotten rid of a spirit and that spirit coming back. So I believe that a big problem in the body of Christ is familiar spirits, transference of spirits, and ignorance. And a Christian can be bound by a demonic presence. It will really take a lot for a Christian to be totally possessed by the devil. And I I really have never seen that. But the principle is that a demon spirit does not get in your spirit. But witchcraft is a work of the flesh. And if you could just understand that principle, witchcraft is a work of the flesh. And rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. So I guess it's how you see demons. If you're thinking about Freddy Krueger and Frankenstein and Jason and all of these and all of these scary movie stuff, that's one thing. But when you think about opening a door in your life through fleshly things or through operating in areas that you should not operate and you open the door, that's why the Bible says give no space, give no room, give no place to the devil. So the answer is yes. Right. And like you say in the in the paragraph I highlighted that the Holy Spirit and a demon can't abide the same place, right? And I'm glad you clarified with witchcraft being a work of the flesh, you know, and not the spirit. You know, I look at it like the realm that the Holy Spirit lives in or, or has come and, you know, abides in us. The spirits can't touch that or do anything there. But as far as like the flesh, as far as other ways of, of harassing or tormenting or influencing, you know, I, I would suppose that's where they can do their, do, launch their, their, their... Well, well, I can make it real simple for sure. the listener. I mean, we can, we can not Greek this, we can not Hebrew this, we don't have to go to the actual quoting of the scriptures. I can give you some examples. If a Christian can go out and smoke dope, a Christian can have a demon. If a woman leave the church and go on the corner and start prostituting her body, okay? See, it's all about people believing once saved, always saved. I don't believe once saved, always saved. And that's just, you know, that's not going to make somebody go to hell or not uh, not go to heaven or hell. But the Bible says it's better that you have never tasted of the gifts of God, taste of the Holy Spirit, and return to your field. And it says that we walk out our salvation with fear and trembling. And if it were possible, even the very righteous will be deceived. And so, you know, God resists the pride and he gives grace to the humble. So if we walk around with the wrong attitude, I'm a Christian, you can't touch me. Like that is all about the spirit that the person is in. If you're saying somebody that loves Jesus that falls into something, I just don't believe they're going to be demon possessed because they fall into something. You know, God's grace and mercy is sufficient. And, you know, you can't put your finger on God. He may deal with this person this way or this person that way. And the rule that I have have for spiritual things. The rule is when it comes to the spirit realm, because I have prayed for thousands and thousands of people and I have seen the same situation come out different. I have this other question I, I wrote down. I forgot to ask you when we were talking about soul ties, about people having soul ties to churches and ministries that are abusive, which I guess makes sense to me now that I've read this, because if a familiar spirit can be with a person, place, or a thing, then okay, you know, I'd never thought of a soul tie being possible with those other things as well, a thing or a place. Would you want to elaborate a bit on how we can have soul ties to churches and or ministries? Because I, I highlighted that and I've been chewing on it and processing it. And in my life and you know my history, I'm thinking, okay, that makes sense. <laughs> that explains some things for me. Yeah, when- but you know, I, I see it so often when people know that you are in an abusive, crazy situation. You know what I'm saying? Not just mm-hmm. churches, but cults. You know what I'm saying? Oh, yeah. You know, people that, people in cults go there because they start seeking. And most of the time it's, for spirituality and they're seeking the true and the living God and they get involved in some foolishness, you know, and then when they get in it, it's got to be something spiritual that will make people get in a church and go along with things that everything in the word of God says is illegal. So that, that means that that person is blinded in the soul realm because that's the worst place 
to be blinded when your soul is darkened. You know, there's a scripture that says, be careful that the light in you be not dark. And so soul ties can occur, can happen, can take place when people, you know, just get so caught up into the man, okay, into the actual people or the relationships there. In other words, they worship the preacher more than they worship God, and their relationship with the people in the church is closer than their relationship with the Holy Spirit. Then you can easily get a soul tie because the foundation of your salvation is not God. It's like you want to be a part of something, and you know how cults and, and— And listen, I even know people that have left the church. I've talked to them. that have left the church and joined Covens and joined and went to the other side and started doing witchcraft. And knowing they knew better, but they got involved in these kind of things because people can have soul ties with money or soul ties with the lust for things. And that love of money, that's what's happening to them. I, I know people that I really believe, and this is, I'm in the African American community, and I know people who literally will go to a mother this or a father this and pay them a hundred dollars to tell them what's going on in their lives. And they'll go to those churches and they'll stay there because. And and they'll stay to these ministries and, and they'll stay in bondage. Though they know what the word of God say about these things, they do it. And do you think that, you know, like, I don't know if you, you're familiar with like Westboro uh, Baptist and uh, the hate speech and they pick it at like funerals and stuff. And there's various family members who've left and come out of that. Like I would call it a cult. I think the guy's daughter or someone's daughter, you know, I saw her do a TED talk and she was talking about how like you feel like you're doing the right thing, but then it takes a while from when you realize you're in a cult or you're in an abusive situation, it takes like this long time to to finally muster up the courage and, and leave or whatever. And, you know, I know people who are in really bad abusive uh, organizations or ministries or, or, you know, churches as well. And, and it's just like, well, all my family is in this. I can't just like up and leave. Or there's, there's like some other thing that's not like, you know, like you said, if you're putting more of your faith in people than you are like the Holy Spirit, you're trusting the pastor more than you're trusting God for yourself. And it's like, there's these things that are not as important as obeying God that can be difficult to let go of and resist and detach from, such as family. So I don't know if that might be like a duh, like an obvious kind of question for you, but like, do you think that that's like oftentimes, like I'm thinking of like Jehovah's Witnesses, they're trained to like not argue with Christians, not to, you know, when they go door to door and stuff, like I live in a neighborhood where every week there's, you know, they're, they're going door to door. And if you try to give them a, a pamphlet or some kind of literature of yours, they don't want it. They want to share their thing. And somebody who used to be a Jehovah's Witness told me, well, it's basically demonic. It's it's to keep the seed of doubt from being planted into into their head. Because down the road, if they decide to like up and leave this thing, you know, they're going to be like excommunicated by their family and, you know, not see family members ever again in the church and stuff like that. Anyway, a long winded kind of question, but I see a lot of family ties and deep friendships keeping people in bad situations. <laughs> Do you find that to be typical as well? Yeah, yeah, it's typical. And it's too simple. It's, you could simplify it. Their relationship is with the members and they worship the man or the woman or whoever the person is. You know, the relationship is with the people and not God. And, and they worship the man. So we have to be careful of, of the foundation of our relationship and our worship. You know, um, I like the way my church is set up uh, as a pastor. I'm happy when I'm not there and God still moves. That is the best thing that for me as a pastor, we call it the apostolic, where we train uh, people to do cast out demons, prophesy. So we, we equip and uh, train the saints, just like Ephesians, the fourth chapter saying, but you got to have some real governmental authority when you're training people like that, because you have a wild mess. So if you don't have apostolic authority to, to handle it like that, but, it, but I'm excited that when I'm not there, God still moving. Some places that you can go and people, where is my pastor? And that's where it begins, where you have to receive your word from that one person. And I know that it's good to be faithful to a ministry and faithful to your, your pastor, but the key word is balance. So on uh, on page 34, where you start talking about women as apostles and, mm -hmm. you know, you're sharing some of your, your background, some of your story and the different things you were a pioneer at as a teenager or, or before coming to Christ, if I understand the story right. And I wrote in, in the margin this question to ask you, and it's not 
anything like a gotcha or anything. But do you think that people can have an anointing or a calling on their life before they're even saved, before they've had any even familiarity with the gospel, where they're anointed or they're set apart already, and that that's the strategy or a strategy the enemy sees and does everything he can to stop you from stepping into that or, or, you know, getting a knowledge of the gospel and being able to commit to Christ? Like, do you think people can be anointed in various ways before? Oh, my God. Oh, my God. (laughs) Oh, my God. Absolutely. In Jeremiah, God told him when Jeremiah was saying, you know, I'm new, God. I, I just got here there. So I'm, I'm a young prophet. God, it must be new to you, but it's not new to me. Uh-huh. You see, God said you were in this a long time before you even knew it, because I knew you before you were formed in your mother's womb. I, I had a plan for you before you became a seed. And so that's a powerful thing to, um, as a matter of fact, I, I preached this word on the floor and I say preach, <laughs> but I, I gave my argument on the floor and it probably sounds like a preach message, but it was during the time when the young people that got killed in the mass murder shooting in Fort Lauderdale, Florida. I mean, it was a very hard time for legislators. People couldn't sleep. You know, people are sometimes so cruel and so mean that they don't know that there are legislators who really care because it was such a hard thing dealing with the death of these children and them wanting to change the gun laws. And it was a lot. Several people didn't even come back uh, as legislators. And I, I believe it had a lot to do with the pressure that came on us. But when I was on that floor the night before, you know, it, I was going back and forth. You know, it was a time where you had to know who you were and whose you were. I don't know about everybody else and why you were there. That was my calling. I mean, everybody was splitting. And I don't want to go into the details, but every group, every faction was splitting. In every area, there was a split. Everybody was on different sides. There was no more group where you could follow this one. You had to make the decision. And basically, I started my comment on my debate on the floor because they were asking me not to say anything. You know, okay, we know you're not going to be with us a specific group, but don't say anything. And I told them, I said, listen, I am not speaking against anybody, but I got to speak for myself because with all of this going on, I can't push a button and be a coward and hide behind it. So I basically said in so many words, and I said, the book of Jeremiah This is what I said on the House of Representatives floor. In the book of Jeremiah, Jeremiah was a young prophet. I am a new legislator. I am young in this process, brand new. And Jeremiah had a calling from God, and he was afraid. And he told God, I'm only new at this. I haven't been doing this as long. And God's response to him was, do not be afraid of the faces. And in so many words, I just said, listen, I'm not scared. I am not scared. God is not giving me a spirit of fear. I'm not scared. And I encourage those of you in here who are afraid not to operate in fear, make a decision that you can sleep well with at night and that will represent the people that you represent and back up from all of the political propaganda and all of the stuff that will, will make you heavy and make you have a stroke if you let it. When I said in so many words, I'm not scared of y'all. I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid to make a decision. And I think that's what we all need to do. A lot of people stood up and clapped on the floor because people needed to hear that. Because, you know, you got the Democratic Party, you got the Republican Party, you got the white Democrats, you got the black Democrats, you got the, if I start just naming, you know, you got the NRA, you got the teachers union, you got the, you know, and if you start going through, oh, what's this person going to say and what this person going to say, I let them know, listen, I came here by myself. God brought me here and I'm going to leave by myself and I'm going to make a decision that I believe he's pleased with and that will represent my people well. Right. I guess, you know, I'd look at that school shooting as an example of like a bunch of callings and anointings that were you know, stopped or, you know, didn't get the chance to be fulfilled. And uh, I appreciate you sharing your your insight from the point of view of, you know, legislators and what it was like on your end, because that was in your state, right? With that particular school shooting. That was it. That was it. Yes, we passed legislation for $400 million for school safety and had a whole lot of other stuff with it. But I'm the only black person. I'm the only Democrat in the state of Florida that voted for it because I felt like it was the right thing to do. This was not a time to go with the status quo. 
you know, with all the other little knickknack stuff that people disagreed with, I had a hard time believing that white teachers and I and I did not support the teachers being armed with guns. You know, I, I didn't support it, but I truly wasn't going to stand for the reason that we're going to give teachers guns, not going to give them guns. It's because white teachers are going to take advantage and kill black kids. I, I just don't believe that. And I wasn't going to stand with that. I don't even want to make no comment. I just couldn't stand with that. The, the next thing I have on my mind that I, I'd love for you to expound on is uh, you talk about owning objects and having possessions in your, your home that can be opening up to familiar spirits. Or, you know, I'm thinking in particular, the story you share about the dolls, your, your child's doll, yeah. you know, the, the, yeah. and, and the table with the feet yeah. on it. Uh, so, yeah. so whichever of those you, you want to start with or. Uh, well, you know, let, let me tell you, there was a man who came to my church a powerful deliverance minister and I was doing deliverance casting out demons and he taught me first I first learned the term fetishism up under Dr. C. Peter Wagner when I went to some training and they were talking about fetishes a fetish is an object with a demon attached to it you know the Bible talks about the accursed thing you know it is biblical that things were cursed and things brought curses upon Israel but I never thought about that but once this guy came to my church and started teaching on this and opening me up to where, wow, my eyes were open. Your eyes have to be open to see a finish. Like I can see something and now and I, because I had the teaching and I had the exposure, you know, it's for me, it's spirit. You just won't pay it no attention. You know, that's a natural question. Why would anybody have a table with feet on it? Right. You know, why would, why would you have, I mean, if, if you're thinking about it, that, why would you want a table with feet in your house? So, I mean, I never thought of it. There's so many beautiful pieces of furniture like that. And somebody said, oh, you know, lost your mind. Listen, I have not lost my mind. I have gained the mind of Christ. And just because people don't know, they want to make it seem like you're crazy. But a lot of people are ignorant of the devices and the methods of the enemy. At, at this young lady came in my house and she was actually upset with me. And we were learning fetishism. And she said, yeah, you need to get that, that table with them feet out of your house and walked out of the door somebody that was leaving the church. And uh, so I looked down at the table. I was like, well, you know, <laughs> that's silly, you know. <laughs> and I went to bed, and that night I dreamed that that table was running all around. I mean, I just had nightmares dreaming about that table. I got up and got that table out of my house, and I haven't had anything with feet in my house. Listen, I just believe that I want to have things that are peaceful. People can have whatever they want. Let's make this clear. You can have whatever you want in your house. But I believe that we should set atmospheres that are conducive to the spirit of God and things have spirits on them. Big manifestation. And I never thought about this, you know, so once we get into this, my son comes home from college and he said, Ma, you know, you're getting too deep. You know, I want to buy my sister a doll because I had, you know, I had gotten into this thing where I didn't want no dolls in my house, okay? You know, I didn't want no dolls in my house because I know the origination of dolls and I'm not, coming against anybody else's dogs. We just ain't having no dogs in Kim Daniels' house. See, that's how you leave it like, like, like it is because, let me give you an example. There are people that believe that two men should be together and two women should be together, but don't nobody call them crazy. Well, to me, that's crazy. Right. I don't believe in that. So how dare you judge what I believe? I can believe what I want to believe. You know, if, if I believe the sun is sitting on top of my house, I can believe that because this is America. But we live in a day and time where people that believe the craziest thing. There, there's a group called Mambla. Mambla. And they believe in man-boy love. Uh. A legal organization of men that believe that they should be allowed to be pedophiles. And that's what they believe. Am I going to believe that, Joe? Absolutely not. But these are the same people that will come up against you for what you believe. So whatever it is, as a believer that I'm going to believe, I believe it. And if it's anything that's going to contaminate my, my mind, my atmosphere, my environment, okay, I want it out. And anybody who, who's struggling with stuff, or, I believe that objects can have curses on them that can hinder your finances. I mm. believe that with everything on the internet. Matter of fact, I know it for a fact because you have witches and warlocks that pray over stuff, put curses on stuff just to put curses in folk houses. So my son came home and he, he said, Mom, I want to get my sister a doll. And I said, okay, you know, I got to ease up some, you know? 
you know, let the demon bust the mama, you know, relax. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to chill and, you know. So he buys my daughter a doll that skates, skating doll. And, you know, I said, oh, it was a cute little doll. And my twins were babies. They were under two. They were all sleeping in the same room, my daughter and my twins. They were in the beds and she was in her bed. And so I come in there one morning and the doll with her skates on, head is upside down in the trash can. My daughter's only four, you know, five at the most. And she's a very spiritual little girl because she see everything. And she can tell you, she can see, I don't like that person, mama. Uh, you, you can tell the child has great discernment. She's very quiet. She never says anything about anything. And so I says, Faith, mommy is concerned. Why did you put the baby doll in the trash can? And she balled her lips up and said, she's tormenting me and the twins and we can't sleep. And I just want her to shut up. <laughs> Now, let me say this to you. Somebody would have taken their daughter to a psychiatrist mm -hmm. and said, oh, my God, my daughter ain't losing her mind. My daughter is sharp, bright, smart, filled with the Holy Ghost. And God showed her that. I got that doll out of there, anointed that room. And that's, this child ain't, ain't never had no problems. I mean, she's a beautiful, wonderful child. She's 26 years old now, and I would never forget that time. Another time, my sister, she's a wonderful, loving girl, but she don't go to church. She believes in God. She calls me. Kim, I, I need you to come in and, and pray somewhere. I'm like, why? She's like, you got to see this. Her best friend had a daughter who was complaining that a man comes in her room every night. Little girl, barely talking. You know, mommy man in my room. So mommy is a photographer. So mommy just plays and I don't take pictures. Let me take, we're going to take a picture of the man and, she, and you'll see he's not there. And when she took a picture, a man with a cape and a hat on came up on the photo. I still have that photo. It freaked them out. There's no man in that room. It was with a cape and a hat. And my sister freaked out. They called me like, you got to go pray for this little girl and pray out this room. And we did. But I kept the photo and I showed the photo to people and people were like, don't show me that. Mm -hmm. See, because the reality is what we see is not real. It's temple. What we cannot see is real. There is a spirit world and a spirit realm. And thank God that we have our bodies that keep us connected to the earth realm. And it's our carnal, natural bodies that stop us from seeing everything, you know? And so that's why we have to die to the flesh, even to see in the spirit. But we don't want to see all that's there because everybody will be saying that they're crazy. Mm -hmm. Right. I don't remember the, the photo story. I don't know if it's in the book or not, or maybe I just didn't get to... I didn't, I didn't, I didn't put it in there. <laughs> right, right. Okay, and you were, you were talking about gay marriage in a roundabout way where some people think this is fine, but they'll be the first to criticize you and whatever. I guess that leads kind of as a segue to my next question from your book around page 80 or in, in the 80s when you're talking about this spirit Lilith. Because uh, I took, I think it, I think it's Lilith. Okay, I took the the page that that I highlighted out of the the whole book here to to make it easy. So I don't have the rest of the context I'm pulling this out of, but. I'm just going to read you the quote and then uh, let you run with it. Where you say this, you say, hey, you're talking about extreme feminism. Lilith has counterfeit virtue and is a man-hating spirit that believes in more than equal rights for women. Feminists believe that they are superior to men. Feminism is rooted in the fact that a woman does not need a man. I think feminists should be called masculinists because they are not trying to be feminine like women. They want to be masculine like men. You reminded me of that specifically when, when you were referring to, you know, the people who they want to do their own crazy things, but then judge you for, you know, thoughts or whatever. And I'm thinking of this kind of extreme feminism because, you know, I, I would say I'm egalitarian, I, but this kind of feminism that, you know, I see in social media or in the media and stuff, like you're describing here, this masculinist. Um, mm -hmm. <laughs> so I suppose you want to elaborate on, on some of those thoughts? Well, the deal is that the way things are set up, and especially in places like your country and Canada and right. in England, you can't say anything about gay issues, mm -hmm. you know, but they talk about Christians like a dog. 
You can say anything you want to say about a preacher, but they want to put you in jail for saying something about same-sex marriage. For the record, you know, this is why these folk don't get no leeway with me. I don't care who you marry. You can marry who you want to marry, okay? I will pray for you, and I pray for those. I'm not praying to turn people from being gay because they want to be gay. The people I pray for don't want to be gay no more. Okay, in Florida, in certain cities, they pass laws where you cannot counsel children and minister to them concerning their sexuality. They want you to say that children, you know, you got to let them be who they feel like they are as little children. Don't give them no guidance. And, you know, they want to pass laws where parents where professional people, if you say anything to a child like it's a sin to be in homosexuality, they want to make that illegal. Well, see, that's coming up against folks' religious liberty. Mm -hmm. And that's all I'm standing for. You know, you can do what you want to do. This is America. You know, if you want to be gay, you know, I have gay friends, people not when I say not hang out with, but associates. People that I know that are gay, that are in the lifestyle, I don't shun them. I don't try to judge them like gay people judge Christians. You know, there was one guy that even got on the floor and said, yes, and they're telling people that they're going to hell. Well, guess what, buddy? I got a right to say that the Bible says if you live this way, you're going to bust hell wide open. I have a right to say that. You, you ain't got to believe it, but you can't stop me from saying it. You can't stop me from teaching it. This is America. You can have your island over there where everybody can be naked and gay and do whatever, whatever they want to do. <laughs> but we can, have our, we can have our island over here where everybody can praise God, worship, and believe how they want to believe. And so concerning the feminism thing, all I'm saying is I, I am a woman. I love being a woman. And there are some women that want to compete with me. And I, and I do believe in equal rights for women, okay? I do believe in equal mm-hmm. rights. I, I think that women should be treated fairly in the workplace and not discriminated against with sexual harassment. You know, I'm all for all of that. But as far as this thing that goes all the way over into the Lilith movement, that there, they have Lilith festivals. There's a Lilith movement. I've met some of these people. They're very far on the other side. In other words, they just think a woman don't need a man. And guess what? I need my door open. I, don't, I want you to pick up the heavy stuff. I want to be a woman, you know, and there's nothing wrong with a woman who may be. And you know what? I am a little tomboyish, too. You know, I'm not the most feminine person. So I think that I can be a safe person to say this. But I just wanted to address the issue because people are using these things to persecute Christians. Exactly. I've heard someone say with regard to, you know, like the the gay agenda, it's not enough to just come out of the closet, but, you know, they want to put in the closet any opposition, you know, the, the Christians or people who would speak against it. You know, it's not enough to just have tolerance and be accepted and whatever, but to like silence any opposition to that. Absolutely. You know? And you know what? One of my favorite people to work with, I know some Christian people may have a problem with this, is an openly gay man at the House of Representatives. He's the first open gay man at the House of Representatives. We don't hang out. We're not going to socialize and party and do all that. But when it comes to going to the prisons, we do that and we get stuff done. And then when we go to that prison, he can lay aside that I'm a demon buster and I can lay aside, you know, whatever his lifestyles are that I don't agree with and we can get our work done. But the problem that I have is that I will never agree that civil rights and human rights are the same. And that's the issue with that. Hmm. Never. No. Slavery, no. You cannot come. Slavery, the civil rights movement, all that we've been through. You just can't come stand next to me. And that's what they get mad. You can't do that now. Now get out my face. Now I'm telling you right now, we're not going to do, we're not going to do that. You're not going to sit up and tell me that, oh, we understand each other. No, I'm a black woman born in the 60s, <laughs> you know. We, no, we do not understand each other. Listen, I just went to a prison. And I go to prisons a lot. And there was a very effeminate, I got a letter from an effeminate. I I didn't know he was effeminate. I could just tell by the letter because the guard told him that they weren't feeding. And they used a horrible word I'm not going to even use to call him because he was gay. And he has eyebrows and all of that like a woman. And I didn't see him, but I rushed to that prison to go see him to make sure he was all right. Because he said that they weren't feeding him. Our mess hall is not for blank blankets, you know. So I went to make sure that he was taken care of. See, I love everybody, but I love God. 
And my love for you is not going to make me sin against God. So I'm I'm going to stick to the Bible, stick to the word. I'm not going to cut none of it out for you to like me. So that's the reality. And, you know, when people with the gay agenda, agenda stand up and we have several, we have a couple of people come into the House of Representatives. They're gay and they stand up boldly and they fight for gayness. Nobody says nothing. So guess what? When I go to the House of Representatives, I'm going to stand up boldly and I'm going to fight for Jesus. And nobody better not say nothing to me. <laughs> right. And I think. It even ties in a bit to what you said earlier in the conversation about if you don't have a seat at the table, then you're on the menu. And I think when it comes to some of these, you know, these rights and things in the culture, and, you know, I've seen this in Canada, when the church spends a long time not really having a seat at the table, then we've kind of let the other people at the table put us in the closet or, or silence us or put us in positions where, you know, now there's these laws if, you know, a gay couple comes to a pastor in Canada, and I've heard the, about this for years and years, it's, it's old news, if they come to a pastor in Canada and they want to be married and he says, nah, sorry, can't do that, you know, and they can sue him, you know, just like these things with... Well, let, let me say something to you. That's just a, a persecution of the church. You know, why would you want to come, go, go to your gay church and get married? Exactly. You know, why would you want to come and impose your belief on some Somebody else. Exactly. And, and that's one day I'm telling you that I would be in prison. You know, you know, I'm not, I'm telling you, and I'm telling you this as a member of the House of Representatives, I have a right. This is America. My children are raised up that way. I, I pull my boys out of a particular college for stuff like that. When they came to college and full scholarship, football scholarship, they're in a big room where they bring all of the first, you know, the early students in the sociology class to tell them to teach them all this gay stuff, the teacher comes out of the closet in front of the class. It comes out the closet and then invites them to take home a journal and, and write down their deepest thoughts. You're not going to brainwash my beautiful boys, okay? Mm-hmm. You're not going to brainwash them. And that's exactly what they were doing. And one of the twins, because they are well-versed in topics like this. And when the when they said this and the twins stood up and telling the man, you know, when he's talking about civil rights and human rights, you know, the twins were able to intelligently and spiritually shut him down. And right. the class gave him a standing ovation. So we need a generation that can raise up. Now, and, and guess what? No, nobody's saying you can't have your opinion and let's talk about it, but you're not going to shut us down. Let's have a conversation. Let's let people make a choice. Let's not let it be one way. Jesus is not where he makes us just believe. We, we have to choose to serve him and choose to worship him. So but for those who choose whatever, let them have their way. But these people, they just want to push their stuff on you and they don't want you to have a say. But I will have a seat at the table. Right. You know, I think even maybe you've heard in the news at the, the time of recording this, just yesterday it came out that the Supreme Court ruled in favor of the the baker in Colorado who, you know, he wouldn't bake a, a wedding cake for a gay couple and they tried to ruin his life basically for, for this. Like, like for not baking a cake. Go to go somewhere else. <laughs> yeah, like like go you said. Another, all of listen, all these uh, we went through all this spend all of this money. Go to a, someone who who will have the right spirit. I wouldn't want nobody that didn't believe in what I was doing to even bake my cake. Right. You know? Get somebody with the right spirit, you know, what you're doing. You know, let go to another place that will do it. But no, what they want you to do is they want you to not be able to have an opinion and not be able to have a choice. That you that know, that, that contradicts that theirs. Talking about, well, you say what now? I say, you know, it's, it's not so much they don't want you to have an opinion, but not have one that contradicts them or invalidates their lifestyle. They don't lifestyle. want you to have your opinion. Yeah. Your choice. They don't want you to stand for anything. Listen, you know, in my country right now, there's so much going on. You can't say anything unless they want to get on and they want to ban you. Well, they can get the banning, okay? <laughs> because because my, my source is not in secularism. Secular humanism is the demon, okay? It's secular humanism. And that is the thing that that we're that we're fighting against, and it is a familiar spirit. Mm-hmm. You know, there's going to be a familiar spirit uh, book too, because I went real light this time. I mean, if people are offended by this book, <laughs> they're gonna fall out with the next, so they probably <laughs> they they won't be able to breathe. Because you know, I, when I tell you this book is where the next book is gonna be, this book is a two, and I'm gonna put the I'm gonna put the eight out next, and then I'll do the ten. 
Right. Of the questions I wrote down, I have one that I'm really the most curious of, or at least of the ones I have left. It's owing to your, you know, scriptural kind of study. You do, you, there's a lot of scripture in this book, a lot of foundation in, in the word of God for the things you present and share. And so I found this fascinating. I never thought of this before. Never heard anyone say anything about it. I got a little note here on page 93 when you're talking about King Saul and he goes to the, you call her the witch of Endor, you know, the woman. <laughs> and, uh, and so, you know, for, for, I think a lot of people listening, they're familiar with that story where, you know, Saul, you know, the, the presence of God has left him and he's scared. So he goes and he, in, you know, covertly seeks the wisdom of this woman and she conjures up this spirit of Samuel. And I had always thought or never, never questioned or whatever. I didn't know how to make it fit with my theology of like the afterlife and stuff in the Old Testament or whatever. But you said that, you know, the spirit that spoke to Saul was not Samuel, but a familiar demon that came in the name of Samuel. It covered itself with a cloak and Saul perceived it was Samuel. The familiar spirit mm-hmm. was, the familiar spirit was able to give Saul correct information on what was to occur the next day in battle. And I had never, I, I feel kind of silly that I'd never heard of that or thought of that before, <laughs> that it wasn't actually Samuel. And I don't know, you know, why I'd never given it thought in that well, let me, well, let, me, let me say let me say something too you're gonna after you finish this book you're gonna see more because right. something has to open up when you come in contact with certain people and certain ministries let me tell you this one thing of something i know that you probably i know i'm almost sure i'm almost sure you never saw this okay i can't okay. swear by it but let's go with this okay you ready yeah okay let's talk about joseph Okay? okay. And I was talking to somebody who was straight from the world reading the Bible. And, you know, I'm new in God. I never saw this, but I'm in church and this person is from the world, right? Sometimes the world can see things better than us because we we have religious familiar spirits and we can't see that. We couldn't see Saul. We just saw him as the king. We didn't see him going to entertain witchcraft. But Joseph, when he became king next to Pharaoh, the Pharaoh put a necklace around his neck, a ring, and he had a a garment, okay? So when Joseph first, they pulled him out of the prison and said, tell us this. He said, oh, I cannot tell you except by God. My God will show you. And that's in Genesis 41, 15, I think around there. I don't have my Bible in front of me. So you you can look it up. But then later after he's Pharaoh's, Next in charge for all this time. And he has the ring, which I say represent relationship, the garment, which represents a uh, covering and that necklace that represents a yoke. So he have these things on. And then his brother, they put the cup in the brother's bag and they go back and they bring the family back. They pull the cup out. And Joe said, why'd you take that cup? He said, didn't you know that I would know by divination? Hmm. It says divination and amplified to say divining in the King James. Didn't you know that I would know by divination? What was it that changed Joseph saying, I'll only know by God. Then going to, didn't you know that by divination I will know? And so I bet you never saw that. Well, I, I've seen that he says that to them. You know, I've always thought, okay, he must be, you know, dabbling in something from Egyptian culture or whatever. I've seen that, but I, I'm curious where you're going to go further with it. What I'm saying is it was divination. Yeah, yeah, correct. You, you understand what I'm saying? And even if you've seen it, you didn't stop and say, wow, Joseph was operating in witchcraft. No, I, I didn't look at it like that. I just couldn't, maybe like a footnote, like, huh, that's weird. And keep reading. Yep. We always preach from the pit to the palace. Uh huh. But we never go to where he went to that dark place, you know, right. to where he would say, don't you know, I would know by a familiar spirit. Right. Wow. Don't you know? I think that's further on in the book. Don't you know? I would know by divining. And and not only did he do it, but he pronounced it. You know, don't you know that that's where my source is now? That's why when Joseph was dying, he said, whatever you do, get my bones out of Egypt. Hmm. And why, why is that? Because he had repented, I believe. Ah, okay, this is what okay. I believe. And, I, and you know, and they, and they worshiped the bodies of the pharaohs. You know, they embalmed them and they worshiped. And he said, when you go into the promised land, don't leave my body here. Get my bones out of Egypt. Right. I, I don't want to be one of the 
worshipped. Uh, you know how they, you know how they do the bodies, yeah. and then Joseph didn't want to be. He didn't want to be bound by the Egyptian culture anymore. You know, in other words, there was an influence that came upon him. He got himself together and said, "Whatever you do, don't leave my bones here." Because right. he realized, look at where I have gotten to. I came from the place of saying, only God can show me. That's the word in the pit, you know. But after he escaped the palace and, and escaped what he went through there and he becomes second in charge to Pharaoh, then he comfortably says, don't you know I know through divination? Right. The thing about the bones is insightful. It's new to me to think about it that way. But And I appreciate in this conversation how you're able to weave these incidences in scripture and things with people in power or, or people who are serving in some way. Like, you know, when you look at Joseph as a Pharaoh, you look at Daniel, Shadrach and Meshach and, and Abednego, you, you know, these different examples you've cited, I'm seeing the thread and how it's made a lot more obvious to me that, you know, the us believers were to engage in the culture around us and not just isolate ourselves and keep from contamination or, or whatever. And yeah, I'm looking forward to finishing this book. It's been very... Mm-hmm enjoyable so far, like I said. Well, well, you know, I, I just want to close out by saying this, you know, the things we say, they're going to, they'll cut stuff out and use it in my campaign. And she said this and she said this and I, and I want to give them my permission. Okay. <laughs> I want to give them my permission. They'll cut out and they'll twist it and they'll do whatever. I'm not biting my tongue and I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm-hmm. And uh, the things that we said, people will feel like, oh, you can't say, why, why can't I say? People say what they want to say, you know, and I'm speaking truth and I'm not going to make excuses for the truth. Right. Same here. <laughs> so I appreciate you taking the time to do this interview, this conversation. And how can people get your book or, you know, do you have a website that you want to throw out there for the listener? Well, it would be best is to go to Amazon.com. Mm-hmm. to go to Amazon.com. That's the, that's the number one way. That's where I want them to, to go to. But they are in 144 Sam's Clubs around America, 144 Sam's Clubs. But you can also go to my Facebook. And, and I would just like people, if you're interested in the things of the Spirit or to follow me, you can go to Facebook. State Representative Kimberly Daniels. Now, this is not a state... Facebook is my personal Facebook and I am a state representative and that's the name of my Facebook state representative Kimberly Daniels you can find out everywhere to purchase this book but you can go to Sam's Club in America all over 144 stores Walmart in Texas and Georgia Barnes and Nobles several churches have them Christian bookstores and just come to my Facebook Okay, well, thank you very much for your time. I'm going to say bye-bye, and God bless everybody. Okay, God bless you. Bye-bye. Hey, guys. So did you enjoy that? Like I said, there's something, like, I, I pretty much didn't find myself in disagreement with her, didn't have any issues she brought up. I enjoyed the conversation. It wasn't weird, really, you know, as far as what I was expecting or, or worried would happen when I when I first received an email asking if I would consider interviewing her. Uh, but I was a little bit nervous, like I, I think I said in the beginning, because it's the first time I've had a political figure. I don't know who might come and check this out. She expressed concern, I don't know if you heard, of people that will listen to this interview and clips out of it and things like that. I don't know of anyone ever having done that to my podcast, so I don't know if, uh, if those kinds of people are going to come looking for it. I have had people take clips out of context in a positive way and make little videos of them and share on, on Facebook and stuff like that. I think the one with Dan Daly about done with church was one of them. So a couple of things I wanted to mention, at least one thing that comes to mind. I've got my notes in front of me here that I took while I was talking to her. And I was struck about the idea of soul ties. You can have a soul tie to a ministry or a place And I think I said to her in the discussion, it's been a few days since I edited this, so I can't remember my exact reaction, but it was that that makes sense. That's why you can have some pastor that falls out of favor. That's why you can have some leader fall from grace and people take it way harder than than you think they would instead of going, okay, let's replace the leader. Okay, let's go to another church. You know, some people will backslide. Some people will just abandon the faith because they've had an unhealthy connection to some ministry or some minister. I never thought of soul ties being something outside of romantic or sexual type of connection with people. So that was very thoughtful. I'd love to hear your insights and thoughts about it. My wife dreams things all the time. 
I could wake up in the morning and say something's on my mind. She goes, oh, you know what? I had a dream about that last night. And she won't be, you know, exaggerating or grasping at straws. It'll be like a legit thing. She just had a dream. Or she'll tell me something like throughout the course of the day, she'll, you know what? I had this weird dream last night. And oftentimes we may not know the interpretation. We may not have an idea what the heck it represents. But I've learned, yes, you know, it seems as though God really gives her dreams to, to give her ideas, of things to pray about and stuff like that. So when I was done this interview, actually the night before doing this interview, I was reading up until how far I had been in Kim's book on familiar spirits. And I was particularly fascinated by the chapter about different objects in your home that may be opening you up to like witchcraft, opening you up to oppression and things like that. And then when she said it in the interview, um, I'd, I'd need to be a little bit vague and keep our, our, our stuff personal. Uh, but there was a particular phrase that when she said it in that interview, I felt like the Holy Spirit was saying, Steve, listen up. This is, this is for you and, and Lily. So I went and I told Lily and she said, well, you know what? That's really weird because I had this dream last night, right? So this is the day I'd recorded the interview with Lily, which was on a Tuesday of last week, which means nothing to you if you're listening to this in the archives. And I mentioned this and she says, yeah, so last night I had this dream. That's really weird because I was talking to this other person we know who uh, she speaks Spanish and won't be listening to this, but I uh, still won't mention by name. And she says, you know, I was having this dream where I was talking to her and I asked her, how come this other family over there that we know in the dream, Lily doesn't remember who she was speaking about, but how come this other family is so cursed and, and struggling and, and not, you know, nothing's going right for them and they, they're, they're poor and, and just lack and never have anything. And the, the other woman in this dream said to her, oh, don't you know, somebody put a curse on, on one of their, their possessions. You know, they've, they've got a, an object in their home that's holding back finances in their, in their lives or whatever. I think that's what Lily said. I can't remember, but it was about like, how come this family is cursed? And so Lily told me that. And I was like, okay, okay, that's interesting. Uh, just because of what I have sensed when I was reading her book. Well, I'm just going to be honest with you. Like when I was reading in the chapter about having different possessions and her thing with the table, with the feet, the thing with the doll, I thought, okay, that's really out there stuff. I'll, I'll respectfully, you know, let her share those testimonies on the podcast. No problem. But I immediately kind of bore witness with it when she was sharing that, especially because she was so kind of gentle and, and open to the idea, like she's not imposing her views on others and you can believe what you want. So, I mean, when somebody is not dogmatic, I, I, I seem to really be interested more in listening to what they say, but not even just that, you know, Lily has been going through just, just even stuff we don't need anymore. DVDs, we don't really, you know, I don't think we've used the, the DVD player in a long time just because of Netflix and YouTube and streaming content online. And so we, she was, you know, going through things that we could throw away, taking heed to what we had discussed, what I told her I talked about on this podcast with our belongings. And then Lily sent me a video. It, it was in Spanish and I've not shared it on social media or anything. She sent me a messenger video and it was of these people opening up these boxes with a bunch of teddy bears in them and cutting them open and then tearing the stuffing out and showing you these weird like objects and, and things people had I guess had been placed inside these these teddy bears. And so I don't like to make people listening to this become all self-conscious about their dolls and the toys and things that their kids have, unless the Holy Spirit is revealing to you to do just that. Uh, because, you know, I think Kim, Kimberly said in this conversation, you know, there there are people who they do that. They pray over and they anoint different toys and, and objects and stuff like that that are going to be purchased and, and enter other people's homes. And that's the way they put curses on people. You know, we've had People stand in front of the church, you know, oikos, and uh, somebody said, you know, I saw this lady twice. And both times I, I kind of shooed her away, scared her off. She was, you know, doing this weird, you know, foot stomping thing and blowing smoke at the, like over the entrance of our, our church. And, you know, when Lily told me that someone came and told her that, uh, we both kind of realized that that week, a lot of us, all of us at like the same time had fallen ill. You know, we thought like a virus was going around or something, but uh, who knows, you know, who knows what, what kind of curse they try to, you know, living in Peru, I'm totally not as averse to the idea of witchcraft being a real thing. I know, you know, educated, smarter people than me back in North America don't buy into this and think it's just a third world superstition, but gosh, no. Anyway, I'm not stupid enough to, to write that stuff off. I've, I've experienced and seen what I've seen. You know, I've, you, you talk to any five Peruvians and at least one of them has dabbled in witchcraft or couldn't afford a doctor 
And so they went to like, you know, a witch who, who gave them some kind of cure for cheaper. And I know of a pastor where all four of his daughters got sick and they found out there was this other pastor, this other female pastor who put a curse on him and his family uh, out of jealousy for something, some promotion, some situation he had that she didn't. And she got convicted about it and, and confessed and repented. Uh, I've heard all sorts of stuff like this. So I don't for one minute doubt or disbelieve there's a reality there. You know, before talking to Kimberly, I was very hesitant because I, I've seen some extremes, you know, where people think there's like a demon under everything and attached to everything. And I don't want to be like that and go there. But anyway, we've thrown some stuff out of our house and some toys of my daughter's uh, since doing this interview. You may think that's extreme. You may think that's excessive. And well, I don't care. <laughs> you know, I'd rather do what we feel is necessary for our home. And, uh, but that, that thing with the witch in this culture, people come and knock on, you know, on your door to see if you're home. And if you're not, you know, they, they draw a little arrow or do something on with chalk on the ground or on one of the bricks or whatever. And sometimes I'm, I'm going somewhere and I see an arrow, like a little arrow. I, I don't, I wouldn't have even noticed it. It's like something just suddenly drew my attention to it. Maybe the Holy Spirit putting my antenna up and like around Christmas, for example, or, or when there's votes, like, you know, an election going on and people are going to go somewhere and, and vote that people pay attention to who's coming and going from all the houses on a street and they go and knock on someone's door and, and there's no answer. They, you know, mark it off to come back later with their, their truck or whatever. You know, when you're moving in this culture, you got to go get like a special permit and stuff like that from the, I mean, you don't have to, but it, you, you best do it. You go get this like permit from city hall or the, the police station so that if the police pull you over, you can prove, yes, this is my truck I'm renting. I'm moving. I'm not some thief who went and broke into, you know, somebody's house when they weren't home and stole all their stuff. Well, there's like witches who do similar things. There's, there's these people who believe in these things. They do similar things to like, think of in Iraq when ISIS was going around and marking the homes of Christians, you know, so they knew who to behead and stuff. It's a similar type of thing that happens in this culture. And you know, you're not something people here are superstitious about. So I don't want to sound an alarm and be like, you know, the sky is falling. But I just, I do hope you take to heart some of the things discussed in today's conversation that, you know, the spiritual realm is very real. I think Kim's exact words were, you know, um, we can't see the realm that's actually real. You know, what we see with our eyes is like second level, you know, uh, I, I forget her exact words, but I, I'm sure if you've listened to the whole thing and you're listening to me now, then you might remember how she stated, you know, the spiritual things are what's real. And so I encourage you to pray about that. If there's anything you need to throw out of your home to not hesitate to do it, it's always worth it. I mean, you know, some things might be like Paul says, all things are permissible, but not all things are necessarily beneficial. You know, it might be permissible to own, you know, the DVDs we had, but it doesn't mean they're beneficial. I mean, we're not going to lose out on something for getting rid of some things that could be a hindrance, could be affecting our lives. So thank you for listening. God bless and fire on your head. We hope you enjoyed today's show. If you'd like to subscribe to the podcast, you can find us in iTunes or on Stitcher Radio or directly at fireonyourhead.com for more options. If you want to support Steve and Lily Brimner as missionaries in Peru or find out more about what they do, be sure to head over to their blog at stevebrimner.com or check out Steve's Kindle books on Amazon and leave reviews of the ones you liked. See you next time.